Yes, indeed. You're listening to KEXP and you're watching it too. KEXP.org, listener powered all day. I'm here in the live room. My name is Larry Mizell Jr. And I'm joined right now by some real indie rap titans right now. Billy Woods, Kenny Siegel. They just dropped a fantastic record called Maps. And they're here to do a live performance right now. Flight is in like three hours. Little puddle jumper. Yo, yo. On the daiquiris, yo. It's 211 on the daiquiris. It ruins the whole day when my baby mother mad at me. Spliff could probably jump your car battery. Birds of paradise in the menagerie. A single death is a tragedy, but egg makes omelets. Statistics how he looking more casualties. Killing is one thing, what sticks is how casually nonchalant. Five in the morning, what I grew up on. God bless this sweet home, my beloved horn. One, two, four, blue stone, crouched on thin horns. While I get domed from the living, conch fritters crisping in the kitchen. Grew going to prison. My own celly warden and superintendent, flaunt, flagrant, disassociation, dissonant cadence, free political dissonance from their cages. But leave them open, we got lists of names, pages and pages. We don't want to waste the space the previous regime gave us. This message is to inform you your service will be suspended for non payment. Midnight ravers, head in the loud clouds, both feet on the pavement. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on, you know how I feel. Birds in the sky, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on, you know how I feel. My daily routine narrated by an admiral over the instrumental to keep it thorough. My chain bang glass ceilings, Joe Burrow. When the contract came, white man read while I sit brown furrow. Second Amendment with the beam, rappers leaked out and work for William Burroughs. It could be nuclear winter with an earthquake. The worst people will ripple out the rubble. Maybe suicidal thoughts was the everyday struggle. For a brief, sweet moment, it was nothing in the thought bubble. From up here, the lakes is puddles. Land unfold, brown and green. It's a quiet puzzle. Before we take off, I call mom and say I love you. Complimentary beverages when we land, I text my ex and say. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll come to Amsterdam where the local time is 6.30. Please remain seated with your seatbelt fastened until the tags have been switched off. Any devices from messaging or something has access. Birds fly high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on, you know how I feel. Birds fly high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Drifting on, you know how I feel. Over time, symbols eclipse the things they symbolize. I sympathize, but read the contract before you sign, son. We're not even in contact, still gotta hear all this motherfucker's lies done. Should be surprised. Don't let me catch you unsupervised. Pushing every button, just remember it's no rewind. Mind you, you never met a nice group of guys in mind. Even when it got mean, the bud was kind. Indoors when y'all was outside. Johannesburg and the Ford Explorer, just remember it's the 4th of July. Four boys on the bra. This is the wrong part of town to be driving by Cracking wise, that suicide doors on your ride Electric fence, big ass satellite dish pointed at the sky So much tape hits, FBI agents narrow their eyes Frustrated, asking to be reassigned Been on this N-word for months, I think it's all just rhymes I'm still peeking and if it's just us speaking These N-words is on the decline Oh man Big smoke, I took the honeycomb out the hive no disrespect to your man to them, but I'll actually do it live. Learned the hallway, catch a running, shooting after we spent months trying to strategize. The poor belly was prime, braised, then deep fried. Fresh mint, pickled Thai basil, watermelon rind. Julianne scallions and other alliums gave the peppermint one grind. Non-committal when she said she cook next time.
Treacherous, ephemeral, brain exposed to elements, lift my skull top off delicate, bone china chafing dish, absent minded, break time like bricks, thoughts and cinder blocks, alarm clocks, break spells, crashed out, searched for my own black box in the hills, scorched earth, scoured like cook pots, mango wheels, strewn debris. I was in a wristwatch, buzz down, dancing in the peace, private dances, dance for me. King's ransoms, it ain't no rise, it's free. Half sleep with the halo, dead on my feet. Oh. Mm-hmm. 
to Sam Herring, Hemlock Ernst. Ready to die, no biggie, no surprise, no pity. Lived a couple lives, go ahead and slide. Hope I take a couple with me. Made a couple dollars, it got tricky quickly. What you expect? Play stupid games, you fly an easy jet. Brought a slob to you, Trek. Knew something was off before I even left. So when I saw the missed calls, I knew it was next. Didn't have to open the text. Stupid prizes, couples therapy on Zoom. It's a train wreck. My evil eye ward off hex, though. Space time decline, I'm trying to live in the moment like death row. The sun set in the desert, red glow. Redness in the west, I sip Mexico's best slow. Best cow Negroni, sitting atop the corral, smoking, watching unbroken wild ponies run wild at sundown. Only the lonely big tree like a sundown. Rainbows the night wet, the room fell like Marrakesh. Dust step drift in the window, I sit at the desk. It's a party outside, some have, some overdress. They was going off during Playboy Cardi set. Now they in the halls partying, checking their phones, bass shake the walls. I'm smoking alone in a cardigan, thinking of home. The cannabis single origin waffle cone went back down to the bar, again, wig blown. After party back like Parliament. Ass cheeks and cheekbones, lips sliding parted, butter wouldn't melt, I gave her margarine. I'm looking like the helper, someone who just wandered in. The vibe is animal pets, chunky rings, clunky shoes, lots of ink. Dudes who order everybody's drink. Really, I'm just waiting for my phone to ping. I'm thinking about you, and I'm supposed to be thinking about other things. I don't go to sleep, I tread water till I sink. Breakfast ticking, we're talking more. I can't take you with me, but I'll be, be on, on your phone. phone. You can take me out anytime you want. I've been gone out the night in Texas, feels like weeks on the road. Pissing Mississippi, stopped in New Mexico. I ain't seen my folks. The strands here, I feel right at home on my, on my own. own. On my own On my own On my own Billy Woods, Kenny Siegel, live right here on KEXP. Fantastic stuff, y'all. Um, Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I love this record, Maps. Um, it's evoking all of these kind of snapshots of what has to be a, a, a life you spend a long time on the road. Um, but even before this record that kind of thematically has it going on, like 
Woods, you're, you're one of the strongest uh, uh, writers about place that I have ever heard. Whether we're talking about like peeling paints on tenements or basement apartments or blocks you lived on or Joe Berg or, 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 you know, falling asleep in a, on an Emirates flight. It's crazy. Where, where do you think that comes from in your observational uh, pen? Um, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, my mother is a writer and a professor. I've read a lot as a child, and I, I, a lot of credit just goes to her in that. Um, we moved, around, you know, I lived a lot of places. I was born in the U.S. My mother's from Jamaica. My father's from Zimbabwe. We went to Zimbabwe when I was a kid, came back, spent time in Jamaica, New York. Um, and so always being attuned. I think also never having a place that is like a center made me more attuned to all the places that I was, you know? Mm. Um, so I think that's part of it. Uh, I walk around and look around a lot, you know? That's, what, that's, that's pretty much it, I think. Or, um, I think once upon a time, you might remember this, uh, when there were MCs who kind of had like parentage that, that had some like academic uh, background, they'd be looked at as, you know, privileged in, in, in a sense, you know, because of the security that affords or whatever. I wonder if you interpret um, your, your pedigree as being the son of a, a Zimbabwean revolutionary, a Jamaican academic, uh, is there a privilege in it in terms of how what what a writerly writer you are? Well, I think there's there's a couple parts to that question. One hundred percent, if somebody is like, oh, how get such a good writer? It's like, you know, Steph Curry's dad played in the NBA. You know, his mother right. was like an athlete. It's not a total accident to both of the kids. So yeah, my my dad had three PhD, two PhDs, and a law degree. My mother. Um, came from a, a small mountain in Jamaica to get a PhD and be a foremost like a uh, Shakespeare scholar and mm. um, uh, feminist critic. So these, so I had that going for me from the beginning. And I definitely would say in a material sense, um, when we moved to Zimbabwe, I, I mean, my life there was privileged in some ways, you know, it's a, for lack of a better word, developing country, but uh, my father was in the government. We had like lots of things. If you listen to my music, um, and then he died, and we moved back here, and I had a different type of life. And I think all of those things inform um, where I'm coming from. And I, I think I benefited from those juxtapositions. You know, yeah. Um, I came back here and was just another black kid with a single mother when I was a teenager, but it really. Uh, and there were other things in Zimbabwe. Some, it wasn't a paradise, you know. We had certain material things, and then there were a lot of other things about moving to a country that's um, just gotten out of a brutal 10-year civil war against white supremacy that, looking back, you see how traumatized everybody in the society was um, in ways that I hadn't seen because I came there after it was over to a certain extent. Um, so, yeah, I, I was privileged in... Um, in certain ways, for sure. You know, I was also very lucky in the timing, meeting somebody like Vordo, mm -hmm. uh, because he really opened my eye. I always was a fan of rap. That was the person who made me be like, you could do it. Uh, so I owe him that. That's deep. It's like my mother, Vordo Mega, you know, uh, those, are, those are two people that uh, rank high in terms of people who put me in position to do this. Right on. Vortal Mega, one half of Cannibal Ox. Of course, you you really jumped outside, if you will, musically speaking, during that like Halcyon days, the beginnings of what we call indie rap, late 90s, early 2000s, and really observed that. And you started your own label, Backwood Studios, and that's like turned into a, its own like long going concern where you're platforming all these amazing artists yourself. Did you ever see yourself getting to this point? I mean, if I'm going to be honest, yeah. uh, the thing is when you're, you know, 22 years old, you have all sorts of crazy ideas that then, so I guess when I was 22 or 23, I thought, of course, this is exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm friends with Vordo, Can Ox is blowing up. I think I'm great. Um, and then, you know, the actual reality when 
moved back to New York and started doing it was very different in 10 years of getting beat in the head mm. before really making more progress. But um, so, yeah, I did. Then I wasn't sure, yeah. didn't really think so. And um, I'm happy to be in a position to do what I'm doing. I'm very grateful. And I'm also happy that so many great artists um, I'm able to work with and do things with through the label and the people that have helped make the label success. You know, Willie Green mm. mixes and masters a lot of our stuff and is a key to a lot of what we do as well as being an incredible beat maker. My close friend, Elucid, you know, when I, I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't that when I saw him perform at that Yule Prague, shout out to NASA, by the way. Um, if I didn't say, man, I gotta get, I gotta get with this dude. He's the best. Like, I need to, I need that. Um, and working with him, he's my friend. He's an incredible artist. And working with him, it was like, we both went like this after that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then people on the label, the the younger artists, Fielded, Fat Boy Sharif, um, uh, Akai Solo. Um, who had the trust to come and work with me and with us, um, uh, my business partner, Anton, with us uh, to do things. It's super appreciated. And I just hope and think bigger things are still to come. Mm. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the Lucid, of course, you know, uh, together, collectively, your arm and hammer, uh, iconic duo right there. Sorry for using the word iconic. I hate that word, but it keeps creeping in. <laughs> I'll somehow. take it, man. People <laughs> said a lot worse things about me. I'll Say take that. It. Right on. Um, in all of your music, in all of the permutations you've been in, um, you, you, your music is coded in ways that can like thrill a long time hip hop lover. You know, I hear references to Biggie, uh, to Nina Simone, uh, like in the FaceTime joint uh, with Sam Herring there. Um, to Prodigy, from Mob Deep, all sorts of stuff. I wonder if, you know, because we live in this age where like the, the, the traditionally kind of coded things that were in uh, black expression for means of survival, for means of just keeping the heat off of you, gets kind of dissected and explored like on a site like Genius. Um, do you... Do you like, does it bring you delight when somebody is like picking up on, on all these parts or do you also, or do, or do you derive delight when people are kind of like not catching everything? Um, well, I think the thing is with my music is that there's a lot of, it'd be hard for somebody to pick up on it all sure. because I try to make it where you don't need to, you don't need to grasp, like you don't need to know ready to die yeah. to be like, for it to make sense, ready to die, it's no biggie, no surprise. Right. You know, that doesn't need to make sense. But if you know, or everyday struggle, maybe suicidal thoughts was the everyday struggle. If you know, it's an added layer, but you wouldn't need to know. And similarly, like the, um, I don't know, like fans I have who maybe watch sports, there's like mm. uh, my chain bang glass ceilings, Joe wow. Burrow. Like Joe Burrow, I don't know if he still does, but when he was a rookie, he was like white boy with the chain. You know, and uh, it's but that's like, also a prodigy reference. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a prodigy reference. But then the sports references, if you know that mm -hmm. he had this little kind of rinky dink iced out chain. Mm -hmm. And then obviously he's like the prototypical blonde white quarterback bangs a glass ceiling instead of glass table. Right. Like prodigy or whatever. So there's I think there's always different things or I don't know the African people who come up to me occasionally at shows. Um, I did a show in Australia. And um, in Australia, there were a decent amount of like uh, Sudanese people, some mm -hmm. Zimbabwean and Botswana, South African people who came up, and some of them would just pick up on totally different, uh, 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 totally different references or whatever. This one came up. He was like, "When I heard you say wide open and like Congo and independence, just gave him, I was like, all right, yeah, I dig that." And so. I, I I don't think anyone's getting all of them, sure. you know, but I, I think um, I do enjoy that. I do enjoy that, especially sometimes if it's the ones that I think, oh, that's probably just to amuse myself, but, mm -hmm. you know. I think it's really <clears throat> your background, the way you just talked about, you know, um, the folks who related to your music when you were in Australia, um, and your background, having lived in Zimbabwe. There's all this dialogue nowadays 
and this is bigger than hip hop, of course, about African Americans and Africans. And I feel like there's this kind of engineered enmity going on. I just wondered if you, as a person who's uh, being perceived probably in both places as just a black kid in New York, like you were talking about, or in Zimbabwe when you lived there, if you had any kind of thoughts on on that kind of. Well, I think um, it's funny because Ethiopes, the album yeah, I made with Preservation, right. shout out to Preservation. Um, and those records, Ethiopes and Church, you know, they helped pave the way for the success of this record. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Ethiopes was uh, my attempt to really tangle with the complicated ideas of identity, blackness, Africa as an idea, Africa as a reality, whiteness as an idea, Europe as an idea. Like Europeans invented the idea of Africa. Right. Nobody in Africa was like, I'm an African. You're in your di- and, and, and the malleability of identity, which is one of the greatest lessons that I took, or one, an important lesson I've taken mm-hmm. away from life. You know, When I was in Zimbabwe, uh, as a child, I had been born here. We came back here all the time. I didn't speak the language because my parents spoke English to each other because they're not from the same place. Um, and people would look at me and speak to me in Shona. Mm-hmm. And then if I didn't reply, sometimes people would think you were trying to put on airs or you thought you were better. You didn't want to mm-hmm. speak the language if you didn't reply in Shona. And a lot of times there I felt very American, you know, even things as little as the British pronunciation of grass. Like when ah. I was a kid in school, people would be like, say grass again. Say grass, just laugh, like, how are you saying grass? Um, and then I came here, you know, and um, I had spent a lot of time in the States. I was born here. I would come here and visit my family. But it wasn't until later that I realized I was spending time with immigrants. Yeah. Like my Jamaican family. This is a first generation immigrants. I had not actually been a part of black America yet in the in the sense that I would now become because even with Africans, like if I ask an African cab driver where he's from, he gives me the answer he gives to a black American, right. which is either he blows me off or he says Africa. Yeah. If I say, oh, I'm from Zimbabwe, then, oh, Mugabe, da 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 we get into a whole conversation. Mm-hmm. But he can't see it, you know? And so when I was here, I come back um, really having the experience of thinking, oh, I'm going to be in the States. I am American. And also... Black people here will be interested in me being from Africa. And it was like, nope, being from Africa is like something people are going to mock you for and be like, Did, were you in the jungle? And that just blew my mind, you know what I mean? Yeah. Especially when I was coming from like, a, again, a position of somewhat of privilege to a totally different position. And the idea that black people thought of Africa in that way still was really shocking to me as a kid. And... Um, and also realizing that they, like, that's the thing about identity. Other people decide who you are. Yeah. You can't walk in and say, I thought I was black American. And they're like, no. You know, and other people determine your identity. Same way that Europeans determine that you're African. And then they use that to say who they are. Yeah. You know? Um, and so all of those things are really interesting. And I think Ethiopes was about sort of, putting all of those ideas into a pot and letting it cook for a long time, you know, wow. getting ladlefuls out and see yeah. what's in there. <clears throat> Deep flavors in that stew, and thank you for, for delving into that with Yeah, me. and then I also think, uh, uh, last thing I'd say is that having had the experience of sort of, um, the uh, not the entirety of it, but a triangle of the black diaspora of Africa, the United States, and the Caribbean, yes. which I can't leave out, um, Jamaica, which has a whole different aspect, you know, in the, I was at a funeral, the funeral I'm talking about in SpongeBob, when I went to that funeral, Mm -hmm. a family member, again, we're talking about on a mountain in the middle of like nowhere, and uh, people come from all over for this funeral, and this isn't a place where you bury your relatives like on your property, Um, so there's generations of, you know, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, other aunts passed away and we were at this funeral and I'm looking now and I'm like who is this white lady over there and I'm talking about like where we are you wouldn't see a white person ever mm-hmm. um, deep country and so looking, 
I'm writing, you know, not trying to talk in the funeral, so I'm writing a paper to my mom sitting next to me. Who is this white lady? She's like, what white lady? And so after we get out, I'm like, who is that white lady who is in the funeral? She's like, that, she's not white. And I'm telling you, this woman looked like a Jewish grandmother on yeah. the Upper West Side. And um, turned out she was a lot of her ethnicity is Syrian or whatever. But in Jamaica, the idea of race is powerful in the country. It's not like people don't see race, but it's tied to other things. Like you're than skin color necessarily mm -hmm. because it's such a polyglot society and there's people don't realize there's um, ethnic Chinese people, yeah. um, Syrians, Lebanese came there as part of when it was part of the British Empire. And if you go there, they speaking patois, just like you won't even understand what they're saying. My uncle is uh, is, is is mostly Chinese. Um, and uh, just seeing that thought of of race, you know, and, and my mother, it wasn't until I was older there where I realized like my great grandfather was like a white man there, but they didn't think of him as a white man because so my mother, to her, the first white people she met were these missionaries who came from America because of how they spoke, because of the cultural difference. So anyway, just interesting ideas like that. Thank you. Um, your music and, and your pedigree sparks all this. I, I, I really wanted to, to chop with you on this stuff, so I hope you don't mind going there with me. No, of course. I mean, we didn't even get into how race works. I don't know if you've ever been to South Africa. I haven't. I've okay. heard things. Or Zimbabwe, where yeah. there's, you know, they had an apartheid system that separated black people from if you have any, instead of the one drop rule that America had to preserve an imagined purity of whiteness, mm -hmm. instead there was you have a category of mixed race people, colored people who are afforded more rights a little bit than the Africans. Um, and so when we got there, you know, my mother's lighter skinned woman, people would be like, oh, your mother's colored mm. and your dad is black. So you're colored. And, uh, it seems strange. Again, coming from here. Mm, right. And that's where you just realize all this stuff is, it's real and it's made up. Right. You know, and it, people will make it into something else the next day or you go somewhere else and rules that were inviolable somewhere are just totally different and everybody thinks that they make sense right <laughs> words that mean one thing one place means something another place it's like accents like you were talking about grass you know thank you uh again um i read your essay about the uh when you lived in harlem and the cab driver who got killed incredible writing no surprise coming from you you recently wrote um the words for a children's book a is for anarchist. I just saw a physical copy of it. It looks yeah, fantastic. Yeah, this is a this is a shirt from that. Ah, okay. Yeah. See, for Zimbabwe, I love that. It was right a on. collaboration with this artist who's worked on a, on a lot of our album covers and uh, including the deluxe version of this. But a really good mm. friend of mine, uh, M. Musgrove, uh, was the artist, and we worked on it together. It was, yeah, it was cool. It's really cool. Uh, just flipping through it, and uh, it begs the question: Have you ever thought about you know, or do you plan to write a novel? Yeah, I mean, that's what my mother is waiting for. Like, <laughs> it's cool you're doing your little raps. Right. But where's the payoff? Is um, that a version of, like, you becoming a doctor or something? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's what my mother would say. Although, it, you know, there's there's things happen now. She's like, ooh, the Guardian. You yeah. Know? Yeah, no, she's like, don't let me be in the New York Times. She'll be Lord. actually call the relatives. Then. But, yeah, uh, to her... Um, she she has she's really waiting for the novel. I am writing a memoir um, that I have a I have a situation for, and I think they're probably waiting for me to finish it up. So sure. I'm gonna do that later this year. But yeah, about halfway through. That's great news. Thank um, you. How did you and Kenny Linka? How did you guys meet? The Lucid. Yep. Okay. Uh, I met Chaz through uh, Rory, Rap Ferreira. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, then I think I gave Chaz a few beats that ended up being on Rome. Mm -hmm. And through that, me and Woods kind of talked through email. And I eventually ended up one day, my sister lives in New York, and I was out visiting her, ended up over at his house. Uh, we connected. We found out that we actually grew up like 
when he was living in DC area, we were probably about like 15 minutes away from each other oh, wow. where we grew yeah. up. Uh, we didn't know each other back then, but would have even gone to the same high school if I hadn't moved right before high yeah. school. Uh, and just kind of spark you to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why my parents moved. Yeah, if I'm being not real, the best high school. Uh, but uh, yeah, we just kind of sparked a friendship. And like most of the people that I work with, like I have like a real connection with. Like I, I haven't really done whole projects with anyone that I'm not like actual friends with in real life. Uh, and just kind of sparked a dialogue. And I feel like hiding places similar to this album. Like there's some talk and slow going, and then all of a sudden just steamrolled into something very quick and mm -hmm. easy and it just came together uh yeah hiding places uh the first collaboration between you two just like maps the second some of my favorite material to come out of uh backwoods fantastic records thank you for sure i'm curious i was looking at your at your setup um you have one it looked like you were kind of moving it through space in order to get different yeah. sounds out of it. I wonder if you talked about so that. So this thing, I'm going to I'm going to mess up the market for them even worse than <laughs> I've already done. This is a kids toy. It's called a Ucreate. They came out wow. in 2012. Mattel made them. Uh and uh, it came preloaded with some like really corny sounds. It was made for like a 10-year-old to make little beat stuff on. I met some people that taught me how to hack it and put your own sounds on them. Mm. When I first got into these five or six years ago, I would buy them for like 15 bucks off eBay. I own probably like six or eight of them. And I, uh, years ago, I went on a tour where I brought a whole bunch of them and I would do my set mainly with these. Mm -hmm. And I told all the kids about it. By the time I got home from that tour, I think they go for like 100 bucks now on eBay. And I, I bet after this interview, we'll up that to 150. Nice, nice. <laughs> but uh, luckily, I own enough that uh, I don't need any more at this point. But uh, yes, they're very fun. It's like... Very limited. They're eight bit, eight kilohertz audio, but they just uh, very creative. Sometimes like very simple. I, I generally like simple tools. Like I don't like yeah. things that have a million options. I like things where you got to like figure out your own tricks to do something cool with them. You've done some some real cool stuff with them. I gotta say, thank you. And you bring the price up. I mean, you're like Nelly with the Air Force One right here. <laughs> I hope you get a cut. Well, I, I I I don't buy a lot of like real expensive gear. I'm like all about like kind of thrift store yeah. stuff or modif like circuit bench stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm real attuned to like finding things that yeah cost like fifty bucks, but you can do something amazing with it. Uh, I love that. That's the original ingenuity that created all this, right? Um, I heard. Or rather, my brother, I got to shout out my man, Martin Douglas, who I know interviewed yeah, you yeah, and yeah, yeah. before. Um, and he helped me with some of the Very questions cool, here. Dude. Yeah. Um, he said, according to a loose in the interview um, he did with us last year, mentioned that both of y'all get down in the kitchen. That is true. That is another way that we connected. Uh, we both definitely get down in the kitchen. And uh, Woods, I, I remember you in the interview, you were talking about how you'd... Um, you linked up with some fans. You ended up cooking them dinner, which itself is this hugely magnanimous thing. I was I would, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah I've been, it was a cool thing, though. Yeah. Those people still message me. So I'm curious, what are your favorite dishes of the other? It's kind of unfair because I spent so much more time in L.A. Yeah. at his spot. Um, I would say Kenny makes a really great marinated grilled fish collar. Ooh. And he has a connection for some pretty high quality fish. Shout out my homie Blake. He's my fishmonger homie. Um, and yeah, some some pretty memorable fish collars actually. Fish collar is and delish. I'm a also stick with fish. We were in uh, Edinburgh on tour 2019, I think. Me, Woods, and Chaz, and we had like was it like two off days at that Air Airbnb? It was in Edinburgh, right? I am not sure. I'm pretty sure it was in Edinburgh. We had we had an Airbnb. We had a couple off days, and we just went to the grocery store and went to town. I think we made some like whole grilled. Were they Bronzino, the fish that we made I, that night? I, it it wasn't Bronzino, but definitely a white fleshed whole fish. Yeah, we like um, you like broiled them in the oven. I yeah. think I made the broccolini, but you did the fish and all the other things. Yeah, that I was, think I had some slow roasted tomatoes, and um, they were stuffed with like tarragon, fresh tarragon, and lemon and garlic and yeah those are those were good there was something else that night too i don't even remember exactly what but, yeah. yeah i i just know let me say this we we have fun when we get together and there's a kitchen involved i like that y'all making me hungry too i might have to get a plate before my show starts um and i wasn't even gonna get into this but since you both brought up fish it evoked to me ghost face killer um which brings to mind your penchant 
backwoods of, you know, obscuring your face, which, you know, you're here in the live room right now. There's a million cameras pointed at you. So I know that's kind of fluid. You're not on some hard, like, never show the face. It's always behind the mask, a la doom or what have you. Um, I'm just curious in 2023 right now where you're at in terms of that visibility. I mean, I've just kept it the same. And, yeah. And my fan base, for the most part, is with it. So people don't really post my face. I don't really have the time to go around DMCAing right. every photograph of myself. If somebody wants to, you can find it. But I do find it um, pretty interesting that in this day and time, if you search me, a lot of the results will be faceless despite the fact all my performances are, right. you know. It's amazing to me how respectful the fans are on that tip. Uh, I think just recently I tried Googling a picture of you and there's one picture I could find online hmm. that had your face. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'm not mad at it. You know, occasionally I get recognized, but I feel like most of the time it's a result of a hairstyle and mm. or the company location, right. you know, like you're in New Zealand and Wellington, small, there's not that many African-American people, me and a lucider sitting outside somewhere eating, I have my hair and braids. You have tickets to the show that night. Right. Easy identification, but, right. you know, walking around Brooklyn or something, very, very rare. In a hyper-surveilled world, that's that's pretty rare, for sure. Um, Billy Woods, Kenny Siegel cooking up some marvelous stew. Maps, the album out. Now what's coming up next? Oh, I'm sure. Man. Gang of stuff. Um, yeah, gang of stuff. There is going to be an Arm & Hammer record. Um, he, has, he has a little bit of work on it. Um, let me you just know, say, uh, it's about to knock Maps off the, the album of like the year. That. It's, it's really, really good. Okay. It's a and totally I'm not even talking direction. about my track. I'm talking about the whole the whole album is Yeah, it's ridiculous. a pretty different direction. And, uh, you know, always always uh, have a lot of stuff going on at the label. We had Sketch 185 albums with Jeff Markey earlier this year. It's Fat Boy Sharif and Steel mm -hmm. Tip Dove's album is coming up. I executive produced a fielded project that I'm on a bunch of times, a lot of artists are on. I think it's gonna be a really interesting thing. Blockhead has a crazy album coming out at the end of the year. And honestly, I really I really gotta say, uh, if you're not familiar with this artist Cavalier. I love Cav, that's my he's guy. So, that's yo, my he is yeah. so great. And he was, you know, I've always known him. We've known each other since way back and he's just an incredible artist, done incredible things on his own and with Quelle and Denmark. Yeah. Um, but he's doing an album with us, and I mean, I say this, uh, you know, a little bit of tongue in cheek. But I told him I was like, "This is Tupac to death row status," Ooh. you know, where I'm like, "This album that he brought, almost completely done," because um, lots of times I'd be like, "Man, bring me, come early so we can." Mm -hmm. But he brought, I think Quelle worked with him on it, but he brought T through like a crazy record, and um, I'm very, very excited about putting that out this year too um i love that lucid is always dude. cooking man lucid is always cooking he's great and i know kenny's got some yeah stuff coming. I, last year i didn't put out anything but i actually made four albums maps being one of them wow. so i got a, a project with a rapper named pink navel who's on ruby yacht mm -hmm. uh, one of rap ferreras label mates that's uh, really dope uh, and we also, uh, it's kind of a video game theme album, and I actually coded a video game that goes with the uh, the album. Oh, wow. Uh, so that'll hopefully be dropping maybe like end of the summer or something. Uh, and then Benjamin Booker, who uh, mm -hmm. sang on Baby Steps, we actually have a whole album together. Dope. Uh, it's definitely way out of the normal wheelhouse of stuff you hear from me, but uh, it's, it's very, very cool. Uh, maybe by the end of this year, hopefully that'll be out. Uh, and then there's a band human error club a jazz band that i'm working with that i'm producing an album for them uh not sure when that'll be out but it's like close to done and then uh, i linked with abstract rude who's one nice. of the original rappers that i really came up working with uh, we have a whole album that's basically done we just gotta get it mastered and figure out how we're putting it out so it's gonna be a busy busy end of the year for me definitely I love it. You know, whenever I ask artists this, it's it's always like a couple things. This is the most robust answer I've gotten to that. We, I will say that both of us make a lot of have a lot of output, uh, and this is one of the hardest working men in hip hop. No like, not no only question. does he put out two or three excellent albums a year, but touring with him, it it finally you get the scope of he is on the phone doing business, doing artist relations, accounting for the label, doing like every aspect of stuff 
approving artwork. Like, like he just, I, I don't know how he does it. Cause to me, I need to like relax in between all the work. And yeah. like, I literally don't even see this man sleep sometimes. Yeah, I don't sleep a lot. But then you then you go around Alchemist and oh yeah, he sleeps even less. I will say that that guy like does in sleep thirty either. minute increments for three and a half hours a night, and it's it's really wild. Hey, um, that's shout cool out to that. him. Yeah, shout out to him and Earl, who played me some really crazy stuff when I was there. So um, yeah, love that. You know, next year I'm not going to do anything though. For real? Yeah, next year you know we'll see. We got the the book will hopefully be yeah. out. Sit at home with the kids. You know, uh, maybe take my time working on something. But that three album solo run is good. We're going to do this Arm and Hammer for a little while. And, and of course, the label always, you know, yeah. pushing that. Right on. Well, fellas, thank you all for coming through, blessing us with some music and all the music that you've brought us. Appreciate you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for having appreciate us. appreciate you guys. For sure. Right here, live, Billy Woods, Kenny Siegel. It's KEXP Listener Powered Radio. Thank you for powering all this programming, all that we do, all these sessions. It's all thanks to you. So thank you much. Make sure you like and subscribe to KEXP YouTube if you're checking us out for the first time. I'm Larry Mizell Jr. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. This is KEXP. Discover great music at kexp.org.